Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast. We are uh, we're coming up on two months of the Biden presidency, and uh, we've got uh, you know a range of news. We have the, the the COVID bill is now passed; that's done. The checks are actually already uh, have have landed in lots of people's bank accounts around the country, um, and that that clearly you know that was the big that was the big story. Uh, certainly legislatively of the first, you know, six weeks or so of, of the Biden presidency, and that's done. And now uh, we're looking forward to basically, will there be more of a legislative story to the Biden presidency? And as we've discussed in, in previous episodes, that really all comes down to some kind of filibuster, you know, reform, as we're now calling it, and calling it that for a reason it's it seems it seems very clear that the there is no uh bare majority i'm not even sure if it really got down to it i sus you know we we focus a lot on like joe manchin and chris and cinema but i suspect if everybody had to vote like you know tomorrow or something like that and uh they didn't get to hide behind joe manchin I suspect there are probably a good half a dozen other Democrats who would, I'm not sure they'd be against it, but they would be a little wiggly on it. Um, but what does seem in play now, and seems like there will be a, a, a majority for it, is some reform uh, that that significantly changes how the filibuster works, and and the, and the key there is how exactly does it change it? Everybody's talking about, you know, the 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 uh, um, the, the term of art is the talking filibuster, and we kind of all know, you know, kind of uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. That whole, you know, the kind of the Hollywood version of the filibuster. And we know that in 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 practice, the old fashioned filibuster was basically something, you know, uh, uh, Southern senators did to block civil rights legislation. But we know about that concept that you got to go on the floor and just kind of keep talking. Uh, and as long as you keep talking, no one can do anything else. And so it's it is kind of uh, comical, but it's also self limiting because you can only talk for so long. One person can only talk for so long. And so one of the big issues is. How are they going to structure this? Because what it really comes down to, you know, just having someone go up and talk for a while, that kind of doesn't necessarily make any difference one way or another. The key is who is the onus on? In the current setup, the onus is entirely on the majority. All you have to do to, you know, have a filibuster is literally send an email or maybe just, you know, kind of pass the majority leader in the, you know, in the uh, uh, the cloakroom or something like that and say, uh, no, we're not going to let that come. And that's and that's it. You don't have to you don't have to talk. You don't have to do anything. And it's up to the majority to get 60 votes and to get all of those people on the floor and 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 vote. And that ends the whole thing. So the, so the people blocking don't have to do anything. And obviously that creates a a very uh, distorted set of incentives. You do it all the time. There's no, you know, there's no sweat off your back, filibuster everything. You know, one of the things that that uh, people didn't quite get is that the reason that the Democrats went the reconciliation route on the COVID relief bill is because Republicans filibustered it. Now, we no one reported that that Republicans filibustered it. And it's sort of, you know, in a way, it's almost become so commonplace that maybe there's not much to report. But again, if they hadn't, they would have voted on a fifth. You know, they, they, they just would have done normal order and just had a normal majority vote. Uh, but, you know, Republicans filibustered it. So the issue is, what does, you know, the, the door got opened here when Joe Manchin last, I think it was a week ago Sunday, so maybe a, a 10 days ago now, went on all the Sunday shows and said, you know, yeah, maybe we should make it a little more painful for the major for the minority to block stuff. 
And I think he basically referenced, I'm not sure he used the phrase talking filibuster, but, you know, uh, uh, use that use that phrase. Now, uh, Joe Biden did an interview and he's kind of saying explicitly that that's what that's what he's for. But how exactly does it work? And the key is here, here's two questions. We're going to talk about this in a moment. But here are two questions to kind of think in terms of. One is. Do you have to keep you or a group of you a group of people do you have to keep talking at all times or the majority leader, the moment there's a kind of a, a, a free moment on the floor, comes in, says, let's have a vote. And if you're not there, done and done. It, it, is it that kind of thing? Because if you really have to be there constantly and if you if you see the floor for any period of time, then the majority can come in and, 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 and call their vote. That's one thing. So that that's an issue right there as opposed to just sort of symbolically, you got to go on the floor kind of, you know, for an hour a day and say a few things. The other thing is, again, as I said before, as it's currently set up, the majority has to get 60 votes and they've got to get those people on the floor. They got to get everybody together and have a sick, you know, get 60 votes. The minority doesn't even have to show up. Literally, <laughs> the majority does, but the minority, the 40 or more who are sustaining the filibuster, they didn't even have to show up. So th the question is, you, you should be able to flip that. Say, it's not, the, it's not the majority that has to do anything, that the minority at a moment's notice has to be able to not just have 40 votes in theory, but produce 40 votes on the floor right now. And I guess there are some proposals they say, you know, you have to do 45 or something like that to kind of, you know, that, that shifts the, uh, makes it a little more difficult to do. In any case, those are the operative questions. And even those, even though those things sound like kind of obscure technicalities in this weird theatrics of, you know, senatorial rules, the impact of those are profound. The difference in, in those, you know, in those models are profound. Because if the minority, if the filibustering party has to stay on the floor indefinitely and keep talking, and or they have to produce 40 votes or 45 votes at a moment's notice, you can do that for a while, but not that long. You're gonna you're gonna run out of steam. The other and if that and if that's the case, then a lot of potential legislation becomes possible this year. The Democrats got a lot of stuff they want to do, and most of them realize that even if they're popular and Joe Biden is popular in in November 20, uh, 2022, they may still lose one or both houses of Congress. So they really got to get in everything. So this has tremendous uh, consequences, the details of exactly how uh, this goes. We're also going to talk about um, our old friend, uh, old nemesis, uh, Donald Trump. What happened to that guy? You know, he was he was. Uh, I, I, I wrote a post about this yesterday. Or I think it was yesterday. I don't know. Day before yesterday. Um, Many people thought, and I think I thought, that Trump would keep disrupting, dominating news cycles, you know, kind of upending the Republican Party, make all his kind of stuff, that he would keep doing that from his, you know, kind of mountaintop layer, you know, metaphorical mountaintop layer in Florida. But the guys just disappeared. He's like nowhere. And actually, since I wrote that piece yesterday, he actually called into Fox News. But it's remarkable how, you know, you see pictures of him. He's doing he's kind of like a greeter at Mar-a-Lago. Looks a little wan, right? A little, little low energy. When it's not just losing the presidency. When Twitter, I mean, as crazy as this sounds, when Twitter took away his Twitter account. It just kind of broke the guy. And having that happen, having the repercussions of the insurrection, being impeached again, even though he was acquitted, 
and and losing power, it's just like the guy took a, like a punch in the face and he has just not regained his footing. Now, maybe maybe that thing yesterday is going to be, um, you know, start of something new, but I'm not so sure. Without his Twitter account, without the power to make his, and I mean, the presidential power, the awesome powers of the presidency, without having that, why do you need to listen to him? He's just some idiot down in Florida, right? So we're going to talk about those things. But before we do, remember that Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee is a sponsor of the Josh Marshall podcast. Grady's delivers the strongest, smoothest, most refreshing coffee straight to your door for less than a buck a cup. Sip it hot on frigid mornings or spike it over for a caffeinated quarantine cocktail. Grady's reusable all-in-one cold brew kit is easy to use and always ships free. Each kit makes 36 cups and is available in regular or decaf. Ready to give it a swirl? Get 25% off your first order at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. That's Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. So, uh, Dave and Kate, what is up? Hey, Josh. So I wanted to um, tell our listeners about an event that we're putting on later this week. Take care of a little bit of housekeeping on that front. We have a, a TPM member event on Thursday. It's at 6 p.m. Eastern time. The topic is accountability for Trump after his efforts to overturn the election, inciting a, an insurrection at the Capitol. And we wanted to look at what, what would that mean? What would that look like as far as accountability for him after after leaving office and no longer being, you know, somewhat immune or protected from legal consequences while he's in office. So we have a, a few great guests uh, lined up. I'll just run through them really quickly. Jessica Levinson, she's a clinical professor of law uh, at Loyola Law School's Public Service Institute. We have Mary McCord. She was an acting assistant attorney general for the uh, national, for national security. And uh, she's the legal director at Georgetown University Law Center's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection. And finally, friend of the pod, Andrew Wiseman. He was a, uh, a lead prosecutor in Robert Mueller's special counsel office. He was chief of fraud uh, at the Department of Justice from 2015 to 2019. If you're a regular listener of the show, you probably remember when he was on just a couple months ago. Uh, yeah, probably... a couple months ago, we had him on uh, Kerry, our friend Kerry Antholis uh, as part of, his, part of his podcast. So yeah, I mean... Uh, Weisman was was I, I guess there was I, I never understood quite the the um, the the flow chart in that uh, in that office, but I guess there was one person who had a kind of a role between him and Mueller, and and one of the things in Weisman's book was that that guy was sort of the the one sort of reining them in, right? Kind of don't demand an interview, uh, don't take this prosecutorial avenue, stuff like that. But right. Weisman's like kind of like the guy, you know, one, one of the kind of the lead uh, uh, prosecutor in the sense, you know, Mueller is not oversees it. He's not actually kind of like, you know, uh, working it as a lawyer. Um, so anyway, that's a big deal. Everybody and everybody who's a member, as David said, uh, you, you, you're invited. Uh, you are, I think you should already have an email uh, invite in your inboxes. And if you'd like to join us, uh, sign up, become a member. It's a great, it's a great deal and uh, support what we do. And uh, you can come to our event next week. Absolutely. And if you are an inside member, you get the extra special honor of chatting with Kate Riga and a few of our other colleagues after the event. So who wouldn't want that opportunity, honestly? <laughs> um, the so biggest take, pull of all. <laughs> take advantage of that for sure. Um, speaking of Kate, I wanted to, um, you know, get your impression on Biden's comments last night. For weeks, the White House, during every press briefing, has basically sung the same tune. The president doesn't support, you know, ending the filibuster. We love the filibuster. Let's always hang on to it. That, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but that sort of, uh, that sort of language. Last night, in an interview to ABC News, Biden kind of opened the door to, you know, filibuster reform, like Josh was talking about. What, what Biden mentioned or what, what he was getting after was, was kind of returning it to the old way, like Josh mentioned, that you have to keep talking, that you have to physically filibuster. And I think for our, a lot of our, our listeners and maybe just kind of you know political observers or casual news consumers, I think, Josh, it was helpful the way that you laid it out. I think a lot of us 
would maybe assume that it's the kind of Mr. Smith goes to Washington kind of thing or reading from the phone book for 12 hours or those kinds of comical or uh, theatrical, you know, talking filibusters, but it really is just kind of a behind the scenes, simple procedural move. So Kate, I'm curious, you've been covering the, the filibuster. Sorry, hold on. So Kate, you've been covering the filibuster debate for us uh, pretty closely. I'm just curious, what was your impression of hearing Biden's comments? Do you think that opens the door to uh, some reform that would actually be meaningful and, and clear the way for some legislation to be uh, actually passed? Yeah, so I think Biden's comments were kind of the natural progression of movement we've seen on filibuster reform that I think even a, a bit predates Manchin's big media tour. Um, I wrote about it the week before, just kind of picking little details out of, you know, a letter that uh, Cinema sent to a reader, um, kind of various things that Manchin had said. But I think the big thing about Biden coming out in support of filibuster reform is a it shows how much the kind of moderate wing of the party has moved um you know biden tends to you know the what he's always kind of labeled as is he is kind of at the a center of the democratic party and so when it moves left he moves left with it but he is you know not on its leftward wing so kind of the fact that someone as cautious as him and someone who knows that this issue is like the issue right now um, to say what he did to, and you know that those words were pre-chosen, you know? So I think that it's really important for that reason, kind of more evidence in our column of we are headed towards filibuster reform. And then the other piece of it, which Josh alluded to is that we know pretty much for a fact that even though Manchin and Cinema are the only outspoken filibuster disciples, there are at least a handful of Democratic senators who are uncomfortable with the idea, maybe, or who have some qualms. Um, clearly, those qualms are not strong enough to come out publicly. So kind of given that dynamic where they're happy for Cinema and Manchin to take kind of all the heat for this, even if they maybe share some concerns, I think the fact that you have someone with the power of the presidency coming out and saying, I'm open to this, that might also be enough to kind of uh, soothe those concerns or to, to bring those people to the side of filibuster reform, even if we don't ultimately end up knowing what side they were on for, you know, do we, most have, of do we have a, do we have a sense of who those people are? And, and I guess the other question I have is I could imagine if we did know who they were, that might, uh, sort of, uh, the difference might might fall along ideological lines or what I think is actually, if anything, maybe more possible that it falls on, uh, you know, longevity institutional lines like and, and again, I'm just picking this out of my hat. Take someone like Pat Leahy. Don't know anything about Pat Leahy's position. Right. But, you know, long time, always a liberal in the Senate, blah, 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 blah. I could sort of imagine someone like him who's basically been there since like as long as Biden was there. And obviously Biden hasn't been in the Senate for like, uh, you know, almost 20 years or something like that. Um, or, uh, yeah, you know, a dozen years. I he's the type who I, I could see again, just because they've been there forever and they don't want to change anything. So I'm curious, but it sounds like we don't really know, don't have a sense. Yeah, that's something that Democrats have just been keeping very close to the vest. Um, I think mostly because there is being significant pressure being applied behind closed doors and they don't want um, that dynamic to be interrupted. You know, Dick Durbin has kind of, uh, he's the, the whip in the Senate and has been taken on the role of kind of like feeding reporters little crumbs from their their behind the doors um pressure campaigns but you know, he said something just kind of in passing the other day that i found to be one of the most you know encouraging signs for those supportive of the filibuster reform which is basically you know he said something just along the lines of there's been a lot of work done behind closed doors and um you know they'll talk about it soon. I don't want to take any credit for it, which I was like, whoa, you know, there's something to be taking credit for here that he's trying to backpedal away from to make sure he doesn't kind of swoop in and steal the valor of the people who've been doing this. So um, yeah, I think there's there's been pretty significant work being done uh, and, behind and, closed doors. And do we have a sense of, 
going back to that question I had, do we have a sense of what this reform is going to look like and kind of where it strikes that balance, like how much, how, how hard it will be to sustain one? Again, kind of just parsing little clues um, because again, a, an aversion from specifics so far, even Biden was quite broad in his comments, but um, you know, Manchin said something last week, I believe, where he said uh, directly about that he wanted to maintain the 60 vote threshold, um, which, you know, that's an important piece of the puzzle because filibuster reformers, like, uh, you know, a big one that's pushed is lowering that ultimate vote threshold, making people hold, making the filibuster hold the floor. And then when that debate is over, it's a simple majority vote, which would, you know, for Democrats be nearly as good as killing the filibuster. You know, you have to wait out some speechifying, but I mean, that would open the door to so much legislation. Um, so his saying that makes me think it won't be that transformative of a reform, at least at first. Now, but let me ask you, when we say, when you say 60, does that go to this issue of who has to do what? Like, does that mean, like, understood that it's not that you just can do it with 40 votes or uh, 50 votes understood on that front. But there's still this issue of who has to produce the votes. Right. D is that clear? Or that's a little that's fuzzier. You're referring to the forcing the well, minority to produce the votes to sustain the filibuster. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I, all I've all I know on that front is that he cited the 60 vote threshold, which kind of makes your brain immediately go to onus on the majority. But right. even in that comment he made, he was kind of it wasn't extremely articulate. So it was a little bit hard to tell exactly what he's talking about. So, again, hard to say. OK, maybe it would be helpful just to remind our listeners some of the major legislative priorities that Democrats are hoping to push through and that, you know, maybe would lead to filibuster reform. I guess, you know, one that comes to mind is the HR1, kind of a big pro-democracy package from the House. There's infrastructure. Are there others that were forgetting in that list or others that you are on your radar as far as kind of the big priorities that might lead to this type of reform? Well, I mean, the House is doing immigration this week. They did gun control last week. Um, like we discussed last pod, I still think that the voting rights package kind of seems like the most likely uh, battlefield for this to go down on. Um, but, you know, it's interesting kind of tangential to this, but uh, Mitch McConnell gave a floor speech yesterday, which was kind of his most scorched earth warning against the filibuster yet, where, um, you know, he says, if you do this, we are going to make life in the Senate hell. Um, most Senate business runs on unanimous consent, which is just, you know, okay, we're going to proceed to this. Any objection, no objection, keep going. That's just the vast majority of it. Um, so he's basically threatening to object to those and force a vote every single time on every single bit of Senate housekeeping, uh, legislative work. You know, a lot of what the Senate does is unobjectionable work, you know. So he's basically threatening to, you know, grind the Senate to a halt if Democrats take away his power to grind the Senate to a halt. And then right. he took it kind of a step further in this speech where he said, now if you do get rid of the filibuster um, and, you know, tweak the unanimous consent rule, so I can't use that either, you know, we're going to make this a living hell for Democrats. He kind of laid out the, the dream legislative slate for Republicans controlling the Senate with those rules being torched and, you know, brought up expanding uh, anti-abortion regulation, going after sanctuary cities, exp you know, loosening gun restrictions, um, which, you know, I that kind of struck me because his, you know, his, uh, the, the outline that he's working off of is you get rid of these rules it's, gonna, it's not going to be uh, easy for you to pass your agenda. You know, I'm still going to make it so difficult and use all these procedural stop gaps. And then, but when we take the Senate, we're going to pass all this like super unpopular legislation and nothing you can say about it. So I guess in this hypothetical, Republicans have won like an additional 10 seats or something. But yeah, he kind of came out so strong and it's not, he didn't, this isn't necessarily new. He threatened the unanimous consent thing in January, but it struck me as this is clearly something he's concerned about if he's taking to the floor to give this like doom and gloom warning about it. And I think 
you know, his rhetoric has kind of tracked with all the clues we're seeing that Democrats are inching closer and closer to reform. Yeah, that's hey, a good... I, have a I have a question here. This is, I, I was kind of going over this, the, the little interchange we had, Kate, on 60 votes. Mm -hmm. It seems to me it it can't be quite that because if if you need to, if you still need to have produce 60 votes, right, to, to move ahead, then you don't have to talk, right? Because, okay, let, let's think about this, that, uh, uh, you know, Josh Hawley gets up there. He's the lead filibuster, right? Got a, got a few pals. They talk for six hours and then they say, oh, can't go any longer. I've been off Twitter for six hours. I can't, can't deal. And, and then the the majority okay you're now you gave up the floor now we get to vote 60 vote but that's what it already is and they don't so if it's that you actually don't have to talk right. because you only have to talk if if you're trying to prevent something and since democrats don't have 60 votes it doesn't matter if they if if you're trying to prevent them from doing a vote in in the way it is now yeah so now having said that i don't know exactly what um, what Manchin means by that. I guess there's, you know, there's the 60 vote threshold and you could, uh, you know, as I said before, you could shift the balance. You know, the minority has to, has to keep showing up. Um, but there's something we're not getting I mean, there. There's also the one reform where the threshold to end the debate and go to vote starts at 60 and then goes down in time, you know, right, so he might have right, been referring right. to that. It's, you know, it, like I said, it wasn't super articulate uh, of a comment. I, and I think he was really just trying to well, probably intentionally. So at some level, right. you don't want to you want to keep it you want to keep it vague. Um, I think they're just I think my sense is that they are trying to like iron this out totally you know emerge as an ironclad everyone who's been wooed has been wooed mansions on board cinemas on board here's what we're doing because they know it's going to be such a republican explosion of anger right. and um you know obviously the covid relief bill went incredibly well and democrats got a lot of what they wanted but um you know i think there was a sense of being a bit shaken by mansions 11th hour uh, maybe i'll vote for portman's uh, unemployment insurance thing i mean that didn't look great i don't imagine it felt great for those who were marshalling this bill through and had already given press briefings talking about this thing and pass be the best thing for americans ever and then you have mansion being like well i don't know you know so i think they're really trying to lock everyone down well that is the thing on setting aside the filibuster you know in all of this legislation that we think or hope may happen if there's a significant change in the filibuster we've already you know you have to get you still have to get your 51 votes or 50 with the vice president. So it's not like, um, you know, it's it's like full steam ahead with the Bernie agenda or right. the Biden agenda, necessarily. There's clear, you know, once in 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 uh, in some ways. And this is why I think I, I can't remember if I said it in the last podcast or maybe one of my one of my posts that, in fact, uh, loosening or getting rid of the filibuster actually makes horse trading more likely bipartisanship more likely because then the democrats actually do have to get all their 50 votes and and you know then maybe i i could imagine uh a situation where okay you know uh democrats come in with their climate bill and mansion says no way you know i'm from a coal state blah 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 and maybe Manchin then says, first of all, I am not going to vote for this. Let me be clear. I'm never going to vote for that bill. However, I'm going to go talk to like Mitt and Murkowski and, you know, these people for this bill. And that I, I think something like that could happen. But obviously it will be a very watered down, certainly from, you know, people who are kind of more in the in the, you know, kind of Green New Deal camp. Uh, and then he'll say, hey. This is the bill that's on offer. I'm not voting for that one. And, you know, so a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of things, um, a lot of things can happen. So I would say, you know, the kind of bright spot for progressives with that, you know, that true fact that Manchin is still, you know, even doing its simple majority, he is the rightmost Democrat. So 
has to pass him to pass everyone. But, you know, who would have thought if someone had told us before it happened that Manchin was going to vote for a $1.9 trillion relief plan? I mean, you would have said no way. So, you know, things are definitely changing in the party, even for its rightmost wing, I think. It's right. interesting. T- it's interesting, too, though, that that, you know, we talk about him as being the rightmost, and I think he is. But but uh, he's also West Virginia, which is a state that has that has historically relied on huge subsidies from the federal government um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and on a lot of things, he's not particularly right wing at all. I mean, you know, there was that uh, interview I think he did with Axios with Mike Allen, uh, you know, sometime in the last week where he basically said, yeah, I'm for a huge stimulus bill, but I'm going to demand higher corporate taxes. Well, yeah. OK, like that, that that's a door that's going to you're going to push right through in the Democratic caucus. <laughs> so I, I think what it is, it's it's more that, um, you know, he's from a state that is overwhelmingly pro Trump. But his issues are climate, guns, these issues that, you know, it, it's weird that, that, that uh, you know, climate is one thing because coal in his state, that's a, we can, you can hate that, but you can understand that. But it's also a rural state, Trumpy state. So things like guns and stuff, he's going to be, he's not going to be on, on, on board for really, um, you know, for really big stuff. But on other things, he's not really terribly right wing he clearly has um you know he's got a a shtick that works in west virginia one other point i want to make on this on 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 you know you captured it brilliantly yesterday kate with with what was the actual words of your headline oh uh mcconnell threatens to grind the senate to a halt if democrats take away his power to grind right 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 (laughs) so uh here, here's the thing. Now, my take on that is sort of like, as long as you, as long, you know, because they'll say like, you know, uh, what's what's the word? Like, you won't be able to turn on a light, right? Mm-hmm. Without, you know, unanimous consent, blah, 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 blah. And to me, if you're not passing any laws, why do we need the lights turned on? Like, like okay, grind it to a halt. I mean, because it, as you say, it has already been ground to a halt. And I think part of there's a there's a cleavage here, though, and that is that I'm sure the longtime senators that would be very annoying to them. Right. But why are we doing this? They're there because Democratic voters voted for them. And and, you know, Democrats support a range of things, but they voted to pass some bills. So. And this whole grinding to a halt, again, if you're not passing legislation, grind it to a halt. For for for, you know, for some senators that may be a bummer, because you work there, you don't want it to be kind of like you're constantly going to votes and all this kind of nonsense. But again, the real stakeholders here are voters, and if you're a Democrat who you know the people who voted for the Democratic senators, if you can't pass any laws, like, okay, shut it down. Right. Because because who cares? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on this. One, we actually talked to Adam Jenlison about this when we had him in on the inside briefing, um, you know, about what kind of procedural delays the minority party can do. And he said on the on our briefing, you know, like he can make it annoying he can't delay legislating forever, which is kind of the operative point. Two, you know, the Senate creates its own rules. There's nothing to stop them from tweaking the unanimous consent rule if McConnell made good on this promise. And then three, you know, this is kind of reminiscent of what Marjorie Taylor Greene's been doing in the House for no apparent reason, which is, you know, call uh, call for a motion to dismiss constantly. It's, it's of the same vein where she's forcing everyone to come back to the floor uh, and vote on stuff that used to be just kind of pro forma. And that's been happening in the house for what, like she found out about this a few weeks ago and has been using it a lot. And even Republicans are super pissed and sick of it. So, you know, I understand that there are, you know, I can't see like the Ted Cruz's or the Josh Hawley's ever kind of tiring of this performative obstruction, but I think there are going to be other Republicans who will. And I think at some point people are going to have to start campaigning and are not going to want to be 
you know, tied to the capital at all, at all times. So, you know, the choice, like you say, Josh, to me is don't legislate at all, legislate with some potentially annoying delays that you also may be able to address. Like that doesn't seem like that hard a choice to me. Right. Well, it's, it, it's, it's also, um, well, there's, there's two points here. Um, one is, uh, it, what you referred to, and it's important for people to know this, they are the rules of the Senate. There's kind of like a constitution of the Senate that is voted on at the beginning of every two year cycle. And that's kind of, those are the rules. But at any moment, the majority can say, we're holding a majority vote to change the rules. So for all of this stuff, all the kind of gobbledygook we're talking about, if they had the agreement of all 50 senators at any moment, they could Chuck Schumer could say, okay, right now we're getting rid of the unanimous consent rule, 50 votes, done and done. And, you know, whether you can do that is another matter. But they have the ability to do it if they have all 50 votes at any, at any time. The other thing I want to kind of get in here about the filibuster is that, and this is the part that I think people don't figure on. There's what you can do. Do you need 60 votes? Do you need the 40 votes? All this kind of stuff. And, you know, when does it have to stop and blah, 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 blah. But I think at least as big a deal is that you're talking about something that makes it very visible what is happening. Because with the status quo ante, with how it is right now, again, uh, Mitch McConnell just says, uh, Chuck, no voting on this. That's not public. It's in an email. It's in a little momentary conversation. So all the public knows is the kind of like, oh, you know, there was going to be this big legislation on this, that, or the other, and it just never happened. Well, that's, you know, that's Congress. That's politicians. Government can't act, all this kind of stuff. And often it's, pre it's, it's presented as like, you know, democratic failure and all this kind of thing. If you have a talking filibuster, you're going to have, all right, we're trying to vote on this. And each day, okay, here's Ted Cruz again. Still will not shut the fuck up and let them vote. Now, given how polarized things are, right, uh, I'd, it is not lost on me that they can probably sustain that for some time. But there won't be any question who is preventing votes. And I think that is, again, it starts to take a toll. It's annoying. It'll be annoying to everybody. So that is a part of it that goes beyond just, you know, when do you technically, when does it have to stop? That you 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 pay a public price. Yeah, well, that's a, probably a good place to, to leave it there. And maybe we can spend the last part of the show talking about what you mentioned earlier, Josh, which is the total disappearance of Donald Trump. Um, I think a lot of us assumed Maybe after the election, he would not go quietly, but, you know, still cause a ruckus. And obviously, you know, the month of January was a totally insane month after an insane 2020, the first month of 2021, starting with the insurrection and going forward with the attempts to overturn the election. Um, all of that wrapped up, just made it incredibly newsy and just kept Donald Trump really in the headlines day after day. But after his disappearance from Twitter, all he's really been able to do is send these kind of sad, low energy emailed statements, right? He had one that was railing against the Wall Street Journal editorial board and saying, who even cares about the Wall Street Journal anymore? Well, no one cares more about newspaper recognition than Donald Trump does. There was another railing against Karl Rove, who I think criticized Trump's CPAC speech. So he, you know, these were kind of sad, but, um, you know, pointed attempts to show, hey, I'm still the boss, you know, conservative establishment, I'm still the guy that you need to suck up to and fear when kind of election day comes. Um, Kate, I'm curious, like what your take on all this is. Um, in a way, it's obviously nice that Trump is not so dominant in the headlines every day that the, you know, the last four or five years of our lives have literally been consumed by him day in and day out. But have you been surprised kind of like Josh that he's faded to the background in such a such a big way. I mean, he's had a couple interviews here and there. He showed up to Sarah Huckabee Sanders, I think maybe a campaign event to um, say a few words. But other than that, he's kind of been a non-entity. Um, 
I don't know if I'm surprised. I guess just thinking about who Trump is, the only thing he's really ever cared about talking about are like issues that pertain to him directly. So, I mean, I wouldn't see him having a huge motivation to like go on Fox and rail against the COVID relief bill because like, A, he doesn't care. B, I'd be shocked if he knew it was in it. You know, like legislating is not something he cares about. Um, You know, flip side of that, I don't really think he cares about legislative obstruction by his own party either. So, uh, you know, and even on kind of the Fox issues of the day, Trump never, you know, would just go up and be like, what about what they're doing to Dr. Seuss? You know, (laughs) like that's, that's Don Jr. territory. Like the elder literally only ever talked about things in connection with himself. And whenever he was trying to give a speech that was about something else like COVID, um, you know, it's like every two lines, it's like that 2016 victory. Beautiful. <laughs> it was beautiful. I guess you know? one, exe- one exception is he did weigh in on the Meghan Markle interview, right? Said that she's no good or something like that. Or I guess that was conveyed through an aide potentially. So it wasn't even. Was that? Um, did he go on? Did he? I, I thought he didn't he also go on Fox a couple weeks ago or something? Or maybe I was thinking maybe he did that in a in a in a call in. Um, I you know, it's, it's yesterday it, he was saying that Meghan Markle would be his ideal 2024 presidential opponent opponent or something like that so (laughs) cool yeah I don't know it's just kind of he is like an an unserious person fundamentally who got this huge spotlight because he won this upset upset election mostly based on the fact that a lot of Americans liked his personality and like wanted to be a rich guy like he is so I don't feel like he has a lot to bring to the table i mean i'm kind of most interested when it comes to him and the whole going after like the republican party apparatuses for using his name and fundraising because that i think could potentially be really important if he stays focused on it long enough to actually enforce that but you know his his biggest power now is that he's a huge draw for republicans he's a money draw he's like uh people draw when we're allowed to be in person again and you know it's harder for the party that's out of power to raise money and get attention and Trump is their big celeb so as 2022 nears he is going to become increasingly important to them um and you know you can already see it playing out like in the in Ohio um Republicans are kind of jockeying to take Rob Portman's seat who announced he was retiring last month and it's just something to watch because you have um, on the the of the two kind of most high profile candidates, you have Josh Mandel, who ran against Sherrod Brown twice. He lost the first time he dropped out of the race the second time. Um, he's kind of always Trumpy and his, uh, you know, likes doing kind of outrageous tweets to get atten- tweets to get attention. But then the other one is this um, woman, Jane Timken, who was the Ohio Republican Party chair before this, who stepped down, who her transformation has just really been incredible. You know, she talked about Anthony Gonzalez, who's a representative in the house who voted to impeach Trump a month ago and said, you know what? He's a good man. He's a good legislator. He had a reason for voting the way he did. Now she's calling for him to resign because of his vote for Trump's impeachment, you know, and they're just so clearly thirsting after Trump's endorsement, you know, so I think that's kind of the most interesting and most potentially powerful way that Trump can contribute right now. Because I mean, who cares what he says about 2024? We're in for years of this where he's gonna be like, I don't know, check back with me, you know, it's just we're not gonna know. So I think how he affects the contours of the party is kind of the most important contribution that he has right now. It, it, it's funny. I, 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 what you're saying makes total sense. I just in what I have seen over, over the last few weeks, I kind of wonder if there's something more up that this is just kind of unmoored him in, in, in a way that will be, th- that will not shift back to what we thought. And again, I, this is totally, I could be totally wrong. If I had to bet, I'd almost bet I was wrong. But it just seems like, I, I think in one of my posts, I said it was like, you know, someone just like punched him in the face hard. And it's just kind of undone him. Now, it's certainly the case that um, with these with these people in Ohio, you know, uh, Trump could 
uh, you know, literally have passed away and people would still be like wanting to be the Trumpiest. Right. right? Kind of I'm I'm the most Trump, blah, 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 blah. So that will definitely happen. And um, and that may become more salient as 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 we move towards 2022. And, uh, you know, he is at least threatening to, um, uh, you know, back primary challengers and all this kind of stuff. But I I just wonder if it's just it's kind of undone him in a way that is more than we might have thought. I wonder, too, if the, um, the threat of, you know, legal prosecution is weighing on him, too, in that the Manhattan District Attorney's investigation is ramping up. There's other, you know, there's the grand jury has been impaneled in Georgia over his call to the elections investigator and the Secretary of State down there. So there's, you know, maybe maybe people are whispering in his ear and he's listening a little bit like, hey, it's probably best if you lay low and not incriminate yourself on Fox News every chance you get. Um, I mean, I've seen speculation to that effect, but I'm not sure that you can go through your entire life kind of emerging unscathed from doing all of this wrongdoing of various levels and then end up being really scared of the arm of the law. I think like it's not like Trump hasn't had brushes with the legal system before and he's pretty much always come out fine so i would be surprised if that's the thing that's bringing him to his knees at the moment there's also another and this is what i thought would happen that there's a totally a counter argument which is that he needs to totally dominate and wrap himself in the republican party because if he does get indicted for something then he can say hey political you know in uh, indicting the head of a political party. This is obviously to hurt Republic, all that kind of all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that would be pretty effective at some level. I'm not, you know, n- not saying it would, you know, work in the sense of like preventing him from preventing him uh, from being indicted or getting him acquitted or whatever. But In a lot of ways, the more politically central and salient he is, that is an important armor because everybody, everybody is against politicized prosecution, everybody, or at least they should be right in principle, you should be against it. Now he's committed a lot of crimes. So like, you know, uh, you can be a big political person and you just committed a crime, so you need to be indicted. But it's at least an argument. And it's an argument that becomes more powerful the more central he is. And again, this is what I, this is what kind of, this is how I thought it would play out, which is to say he holds a firm grip on the Republican Party to make any indictment of him an indictment of the Republican Party. So you can kind of, you know, you can sort of see that playing both ways. Maybe a, um, a good point to end on is just to get your take on his comments about, you know, the vaccine rollout last night on Fox. He said, you know, he encouraged people to get the vaccine. This came after he was privately vaccinated, I guess, towards the end of his his term uh, in the White House. But he also had this caveat saying, like, well, we have freedom of, of choice and it's important, you know, it's important people can decide for themselves. And, you know, there have been polls that show real concern and hesitancy among Republicans, especially Republican men, about getting vaccinated. Um, This, you know, obviously masks have become so politicized and now the actual vaccine, the thing that could really just put an end to the miserable last year of the pandemic uh, is, is its own political issue now too. Josh or Kate, do you think, I mean, I, I'm sure we're all kind of relieved in a sense that he more or less said the right thing, but do you think it went far enough? Was it in a, was it kind of the right move for him? What's your take on the, on what he was saying there? I would say good. He should come out for the vaccine. It's good that more people get vaccinated and it's important. I think it's nuts that he got vaccinated secretly at the White House and didn't say anything or send out a picture. Um, you know, kind of in the same vein of what you said, DT, of his freedom of choice. Like he's so afraid of pissing off his base. Um, but... You know, it's just kind of funny because a, a storyline we've been doing at TPM, especially, you know, last week was the whole Trump deserves more credit for the um, for you know the vaccine distribution process, which is just the juxtaposition is so rich of like he got vaccinated in secret and didn't do like the fundamental public health 
job that is that is the role of the president and every other person with a, a platform which is to send out a picture of you smiling and being like hey i got it you should get it too but he sent out one of his weird tweet slash email statements being like hey when you get that shot remember it thanks to me so. <laughs> well, that's the thing his whole position is kind of at war with himself because yep. because you know he's and it's not even principally about, I mean, they want credit for the rollout now too, but it's basically what we were hearing for the sec, you know, from the, from the second six months of 2020, Trump personally invented it in the white <laughs> house laboratory, right? That he did it. And, uh, that, you know, it's a funny thing. It's almost like I, I, I suspect that I, I think it is highly likely that they are having conversations inside in the Biden White House, kind of like, can we throw him a bone and kind of, you know, pump up warp speed and said, oh, you know, we did the rollout, but Trump invented the vaccine to kind of to, to sort of, you know, uh, uh, deal with this Republican hesitancy thing. I mean, look, I thought, you know, he sucks, but what he said was great. He should say that. And and saying the little sort of throwaway about freedom, like, you know, you, you, you shouldn't be compelled to do it. But he said, I think he said it's safe. It's good. I took it. You know, great, great. I mean, I think to make a difference, he would really have to kind of get behind it in a sustained way, like do some TV appearances where maybe even off Fox where, you know, and I'm sure. I'm sure given the context that reputable news organizations would be willing to say, okay, we're just going to talk about the vaccine. You know, there's sort of a, there's a, there is a public interest here to hear you say it's safe, blah, 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 blah. You know, not hit him with like, oh, what about, you know, what about you going on trial in New York, blah, 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 blah. If he got behind it and kind of went around and said, hey, it's really good. It's safe. I took it. My wife took it. My kids took it. Uh, it's safe. You should take it. It'll save your, you know, blah, 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 blah. I think that would, that could make a real difference. Um, I think one comment on, you know, one comment in a Fox call in is not going to do that much, even though I think he said the right thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and there is just, just one point on the whole Biden needs to be giving Trump credit thing. Uh, beyond kind of the long article that Josh Kavinsky and I wrote about this is that Biden did do that already. Like when he was going to get vaccinated, I think it was then, unless it might've been. It, I'm pretty sure I remember then. that. I remember, yeah, And he it was. said something that seemed like kind of off the cuff, but was like clearly very practiced of being like, you know, you got to give Operation Warp Speed and former president credit for that. Like he said something like that as yeah. he was like rolling up his sleeve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, and then B, I just think this whole concept of like Biden is a messenger who can get through to these MAGA people is like kind of nuts. And I don't know why it's really being considered because I, I just don't know who thinks that if Biden goes on TV and is like, all credit to Trump for developing this, that MAGA people are going to be like, yup, yup, that's what I needed to hear. I'm going to get vaccinated. Like they kind of range from not liking him to hating him to thinking he's already been executed and this is a hologram double. So like, I don't know why anyone thinks Biden is kind of the, the best persuasive speaker to get through to these people, no matter what he says. It's, it's also that um, I even wonder in part because of his invisibility now, Trump, it's so ingrained. Like, I wonder how much difference it would make. You know, there's always been a an overlap between, you know, anti-vax and right-wingers, but there's also an overlap, at least historically, anti-vax and left-wingers. I mean, there's different kinds of left-wing, but people who are not right-wing, at least, who have more kind of adjacency with, uh, you know, things that are that are that are more left than right. Let's put it that way. Um, but now it has become like that sort of that that Madison Cawthorn idiot, where he just said, "I'm not doing." What is he? Twenty five? Is he actually twenty five? Yeah. Okay, he says twenty five. Odds are so good for me, no need for a vaccine. Now, <laughs> on the one hand, they're not that good. You know, I don't know how what what you see as good odds for not dying, but twenty five year olds can get sick, right? 
Um, but B, what a what a gross thing to say, because other people can get it from you, you know. And and, and even uh, I noticed some some right wingers on Twitter yesterday saying, "Oh, Biden says everybody has to get it." You mean everybody, every last person, not just some people, like dude. Vaccine, like you know, do you remember school? Everybody gets vaccination. That's the whole point. It's not like a lifestyle choice. You know, some people are trying to make it one, um, but it is really, I think it's 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 sunk roots into sort of right wing revanchism in the United States that it's not just what Trump says now. I think it's pretty it's pretty deep and all this stuff about freedom and this and, right. and, and uh, you know, microchips and, and, and whatever. So I'm, right. I'm not even sure Trump could undo it, even though he had a lot to do with doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of this perfect marriage of the, the years of both government distrust and scientific distrust being married together and then being deployed under a democratic administration they don't trust, you know, I agree with you. And I, I actually do think that Trump could move the needle on this if he committed himself to doing like a public health campaign, which definitely sounds like something he would do. But right now, you know, it's kind of in the category of, as you're talking about forever, his, uh, his Georgia stuff, you know, telling people in Georgia that you need to vote in the runoff. It's not rigged. It's kind of exactly the same. He like sprinkled in an obligatory comment to that, to that effect twice, you know, amid months of casting doubt on, in that case, the election system, in this case, you know, science. So right. it's just, if you're going to build, uh, you know, work all those biases that these people have for so long, you need to put in a conservative, a concerted effort to reverse that, which, you know, does not seem like it's on his agenda. Right. All right. Well, that seems like a good place to leave it this week. Well, remember, uh, the Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. You can, I'll tell you what you can get as soon as I get the uh, copy here. You can get 25% off your first order at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. That's Grady'scoldbrew.com with promo code TPM. All right. Great to All chat right. with you both. See All right. Later, guys. folks.